this morning I'm going to discuss exercise as a concussion recovery tool. And again, I am uh, Angela Lumba Brown. I am an assistant professor of emergency medicine here at Stanford and by courtesy of pediatrics. Um, I'm the co-director of the Stanford Concussion and Brain Performance Center um, to be renamed the Stanford Brain Performance Center. And I'm also the first author on the CDC Pediatric Mild Traumatic Brain Injury Guidelines, which came out in September uh, 2018. Um, those guidelines are, uh, the materials related to those guidelines are being disseminated upstairs. So up the stairs in the Home of Champions, you'll see the CDC has their own demonstration track which will provide um, handouts and tools for clinicians as far as disposition planning, return to school, um, materials for children playing sports, um, their coaches, et cetera, and that's all on the cdcheadsup.gov website. Exercise, let's talk about exercise. Exercise as a health treatment. So exercise is one of the most frequently prescribed therapies, both in health and disease. There's irrefutable evidence showing the beneficial effects of exercise on health with subsequent reductions in the relative risk of death from it. Uh, people have suspected this as far back as 2500 BC in ancient China. Um, clinicians at that time were prescribing organized exercise. Um, and then even in 400 BC, the philosopher Plato astutely observed that exercise preserves health. Um, with his, with his uh, recorded quotation, lack of activity destroys the good condition in every human being, while movement and methodical physical exercise saves and preserves it. So even at that time, we knew that entering into a, speci a specific program of exercise would improve health. Unfortunately, though, in, in 2013, the CDC reported that 80% of American adults don't get enough recommended exercise for whatever reason. Um, despite the fact that people are not exercising enough, there is extensive research to support why we should. And this includes scientific evidence that exercise benefits specific chronic conditions, such as congestive heart disease, COPD, hypertension, diabetes, uh, cholesterol issues, obesity, rheumatoid arthritis, fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue syndromes, osteoporosis, cancer, and depression. And those are, are just a few of the um, chronic illnesses that have been researched. Um, there are more out there. These are the ones with the most of amount of evidence behind them. And the point of our discussion today is to uh, review the evidence that's out there supporting exercise um, not in chronic disease, but in injury, in, in head injury and concussion. So what exactly is going on in the body when you exercise? Um, a single episode of exercise, if I went out and ran for 30 minutes, has beneficial effects, has changes in the brain, that, it changes in the brain and in the body that are measurable. And of course, it's more beneficial, though, to keep it up as an actual... Um, as an actual change to lifestyle. Uh, a 2020, I'm sorry, a 2012 article likened exercise to a pharmacologic drug. And why they did that um, was because exercise can decrease abdominal fat and regulate weight. Let's see if my pointer works here, yep. Um, uh, also improves blood flow through the heart's coronary arteries, increasing cardiorespiratory function. It positively affects balances in cholesterol, in blood pressure, and in glucose utilization and mobilization. Um, it even affects blood coagulation <laughs> and the actual tone of the blood vessels themselves, as well as the components in the blood vessels, the endothelium, um, to support positive changes. But most related to the pathophysiology of concussion, improving psychological well-being, improving symptoms of anxiety and depression, um, supporting neuronal health, cognition, memory, and sleep. And this all seems very positive, but how does this work? Really, the question is in the injured brain. Uh, let me give you a bit of background, though, about how we got there, how we, how we got to ask that question and, and subsequently um, begin to answer it. So through 2013, most concussion management recommendations were consensus-based. 
Um, it was through clinical experience with groups of experts that brought together what they thought was likely working. And I think as Dr. Gajar alluded to before with his slide of a dark room, um, the concept of your brain on fire, uh, it was a concern that um, doing anything too stimulating, whether it be physical exercise, reading, looking at the computer, watching TV, whatever it might be, might actually make your injury worse, prolong your recovery. Um, what we found, however, though, in early studies um, was that those patients that exercised with concussion, especially those in the early studies looked at those with prolonged recoveries, were actually improving um, in controlled trials. That's when, um, so when we saw in, in these very early studies that exercise improved self-reported symptoms in patients with prolonged um, recovery periods, that's when uh, the question came up about whether or not the benefits of exercise from chronic disease could then be applied to concussion. And the next step from there on was uh, animal models suggesting that exercise could enhance recovery. Following that in 2017, so we're really only talking about a five to six year time frame here for this literature, but by 2017, we saw several studies showing improvements in post-concussive syndrome following exercise program, including some very um, well done clinical trials, controlled trials. And today there are a handful of studies that suggest benefits from early exercise initiation within the first few days of concussion. Um, what can we continue to expect? Well, um, we can hope for more studies surrounding how and when to use concussion exercise to maximize recovery. This is what we see um, with exercise that could potentially benefit the brain. So we do see reduced blood pressure. We see improved autonomic tone. You may have heard that with concussion you can see autonomic dysregulation. Um, we can see a reduction in systemic inflammation, enhanced endothelial function, which could play a part in the blood-brain barrier, improved psychological well-being, and then enhanced cognition and memory, specifically through upregulation of brain-derived neurotrophic factor. Following concussion, neuron injury and death result in dysfunction and contribute to all the post-concussive symptoms that we know of, including those that populate the subtypes of concussion, headache, uh, migraine, vestibular and ocular motor impairments, anxiety or mood disorders, and sleep disruption. But research also supports that the pathologic changes in cerebral perfusion following concussion may be related to factors such as that autonomic dysfunction. Hence, it's reasonable to hypothesize that the known benefits of exercise are particularly applicable to supporting concussion. When I say exercise, um, it's, it has been uh, used clinically and described in a research setting with many different names. Um, so you hear active rehabilitation, that term, an active aerobic exercise program, a graded return to play, which graded return to play, I'll, I'll admit, is um, I think a little bit more of an older term in which there was a very specific stepwise return to play. Now we've moved a little bit more to the language of gradual return to play, um, acknowledging that um, all people are different and that we don't necessarily have to go back down to zero, no exercise, uh, if you experience a symptom exacerbation. And then the concept of sub-threshold exercise. Sub-threshold exercise is when you find that sweet spot in your exercise program where your symptoms are not significantly exacerbated. You might have some recurrence of your headache or dizziness, but it's not significantly exacerbated to prevent you from continuing to exercise. And there's a variety of ways that, that clinicians may choose to look at that. This study um, was a 2018 study actually from the Brain Performance Center, published uh, as a landmark meta-analysis in the American Journal of Sports Medicine. And this systematic review and meta-analysis reported the benefits of physical exercise within the first week to three months following head injury. The outcomes are of this, of this research are fourfold, and I, I recommend actually that everyone get a hold of this paper and read it. 
Um, but number one, uh, exercise resulted in lower post-concussive symptom scale scores as compared to control groups. Uh, there was a lower percentage of patients with symptoms of a concussion. There's a shorter duration of concussion symptoms in those that exercised as compared to those that hadn't. And there was improved reaction times on computerized neurocognitive testing. And we can see that demonstrated here by this, this um, leftward shift on the force plot, which compares the exercise group to the control group. But what this analysis did not show um, was a meaningful difference in balance and neuropsychological function with exercise. So that, um, those two issues are yet to be determined about how exercise may in fact impact um, balance, truly our vestibular system, and our neuropsychological function. A very recent 2018, again, retrospective study, though, reported that earlier initiation of aerobic exercise was associated with a faster full return to sport and school or work. So you see on uh, this graph here, this is the time to full return to sport, and this is the time to full return of school or work. Um, the red line on both of these that has the steepest um, uh, downward trajectory is time to aerobic exercise being one day. And then the, uh, the contiguous line, the top line on both of them uh, is the longest duration. That's um, time to aerobic exercise. It took these people three weeks to go back into their exercise program. And then the dotted lines in, betwe in between correspond to the numbers in between one and 20 days. Um, and so we can see from this that um, earlier initiation of aerobic exercise was associated with a faster full return to school, sports, and work. Um, this study, though it's retrospective, of course, we have to take it with a grain of salt, suggests that the benefits and safety of aerobic exercise within the first week of injury are there. And I think that's, as clinicians, our, our most important concern is, is it safe? Right? Are we going to do the right things for our patients by saying, get back into exercise, um, ensuring that we're not sending them back to, to you know, re-injure themselves? Um, we're sending them back to do it safely. Um, we're sending them back to do it because it is actually beneficial, not that it's not making any difference. It's beneficial and it's safe. And that's what this new research is supporting that it is okay to send your patients back into an exercise program. And it's actually more than okay, it's beneficial for them. Um, this table is from a really great 2019 review uh, with a senior author of Bob Meehan. Uh, it sought to report specific exercise parameters that would result in optimal concussion recovery, meaning that, well, what is the best mode of exercise? What, what should I be telling my patients to do as far as when should they exactly go back into exercise on day one, two, three, or four? Should they be cycling? Should they be swimming? Um, and for how long should they be doing it? For 20 minutes or one hour? For how long as in the duration of that exercise program? Should it be one week or, or two months? And unfortunately, what this research reported was that we just don't know what intensity, frequency, episode duration, mode of exercise, length of program, or time of initiation is best. We don't know what is best, but it did support that we do know that it's beneficial. So this, this uh, table details the variety of studies examining exercise and concussion and, and exactly how they did it. And what you'll note, and I'm, I'll go through each of these here, we have the exercise frequency. Um, many recommended uh, a little less than daily, so maybe three to five days per week, five to six days per week, um, and some daily. And this was, this was um, at the discretion of the uh, researcher who designed it. Um, many of them were at least 20 minutes in length. And as far as intensity, this was determined in one of two ways for the majority of these studies. The intensity was either determined by um, an ideal heart rate based on um, norms for age, or an ideal heart rate they were targeting based on um, the initiation of symptoms. So uh, let me give you an example of that. If, um, if a person with concussion was exercised, to a heart rate of 140 and started having headache, 
They would then put their goal in the study um, to be a sub-threshold exercise level, meaning that they would exercise them to a heart rate of 120 in which they didn't experience severe headache. So those are the two um, strategies in which most of this research is done is by a um, targeted heart rate. Intervals, um, interval length, as uh, meaning the interval of the actual exercise program, was between one week and multiple weeks, up to three months. And then the mode of exercise, for the most part, was stationary bar bike, though included treadmill. <clears throat> and Dr. Gajar brought this up in his talk. Why do we like stationary bike, which can be your traditional stationary bike or a recumbent bike, is because you're not required to move your head around, which is important for um, vestibular impairment that often occurs with concussion. Um, now, I, I encourage you all to discuss this with the Stanford Sports Medicine physical therapists um, who say that yes, that definitely makes sense, but as the patient is moving forward in their exercise program, let's get them off of that stationary bike and challenge them so that they are moving their head a little bit. Um, not to overwhelm them in the very beginning, but so that they are taking in um, movement and uh, proprioception with their body and, and, and um, using that um, stimulus to support their recovery. Um. So, uh, and, and as I mentioned here, all of these listed studies began their exercise programs more than three weeks following injury, but our previous, the previous two studies that I presented did highlight that early, earlier initiation of exercise is actually beneficial as well. Um, as I mentioned, I'm the first author on the 2018 CDC guidelines on the diagnosis and management of mild traumatic brain injury among children, wherein we recommend actually two days of rest followed by resumption of a, a physical activity as tolerated or an exercise program. Um, the majority of studies that I focused here this morning, um, uh, that I've discussed here this morning, focus on exercise in adults. Um, and so in crafting these pediatric recommendations, we were mindful that compared to adults, children are of course inherent risk takers. Um, they have larger head to body ratios. They um, have complex and developing brains, right? They also might have difficulty in verbalizing their exacerbated symptoms because their, their speech and language skills are just not there yet. So I strongly feel that these are, a, that children are a different group and not that they should necessarily be handled differently as far as an exercise program goes, but they should be monitored a lot more closely understanding that they are not going to be as responsible for their um, re-engagement into exercise and aerobic activity as adults will be. Um, as co-director of the Stanford Brain Performance Center, I'm happy to share our current exercise protocol. I know that our physical therapists and our athletic trainers are um, eager to talk to you about what we do in detail and go, th go through exactly um, the methods and, and maneuvers and tests that, that um, our varsity athletes go through here. Um, and they probably will have more insights and all honesty to share with you than I do. But um, we all agree that a moderate aerobic exercise program should be initiated as soon as a patient can tolerate it, meaning that they're not limited by severe symptoms. So of course, if there's somebody who's having protracted emesis or can barely stand straight, which is, which is not, um, not very common, um, they should let those symptoms resolve in order to engage in exercise that's safe. But for the most part, in the very vast majority of patients you will see, um, they can all engage in exercise within a day or two of injury. Uh, so aerobic exercise, let's start it as soon as it's tolerated, likely within a day or two. The exercise mode should be mindful of vestibular and ocular motor impairments for patient safety. Um, I, the, I, the recumbent bike or the stationary bike are great choices. Um, exercise programs should target 60 to 80% of maxual, maximal heart rate without significantly exer exacerbating symptoms. And then the ideal duration um, is about 30 minutes. Uh, for our neuros neuroscience health center patients, Dr. D Dr. Gajar prescribes about 20 minutes every other day. Um, but then for, say, our athletes, we prescribe more than that. So I think um, you have to consider what the uh, cor comorbid factors are in the patient you're dealing with as well as um, 
what their functional status is at the time, but I think 30 minutes is really a very reasonable number to shoot for. Um, and I think, I personally think it's, it's reasonable to suggest that they do that daily. There's no harm to do it, doing 30 minutes of exercise daily, um, knowing that there are gonna be days that they're gonna miss their exercise program. And then for how long exactly? We know that the vast majority of patients will have symptoms at two weeks to one month, and that there is about a third that will go on to have symptoms um, after one month. So in suggesting an exercise program of at least four to six weeks, you're capturing the majority of people for their recovery, um, their, their known recovery trajectory. I would be remiss not to bring up what exercises you should counsel to avoid until a person's recovered. And of course, that includes contact sports because when you have a mild traumatic brain injury, your threshold for re-injury is lower. So avoiding clear contact to the head or the body is a must. But also, of course, to consider um, uh, um, counseling to avoid high velocity sports such as skiing or downhill biking in which the risk of fall is much higher. Similarly, some gym classes like urban rebounding where people are jumping on trampolines, uh, there's a higher risk of fall, um, rollerblading, ice skating, and also any type of um, gymnastics in which there's flips or, or um, challenges for balance. And I'm, I'm being told to stop. So good, thank you very much. This is me doing my favorite exercise at 38 weeks pregnant.